I think there's two main categories. The, the main approved category is for treating rare diseases where you're missing a protein typically. And for, so for example, spinal muscular atrophy or SMA is treated by a gene therapy called Solgensma. And because they're rare, it costs a lot of money to do clinical trials. And so that, that has to be amortized over a very small population. So Solgensma is about $2 million per dose, making the most expensive category of drug in history. At the other extreme for a category of drugs, which is very similar in the way it's delivered. So you have a single gene or a single messenger RNA or a single DNA wrapped in a viral capsid or a, a lipid nanoparticle. So you can see the gene within a, some kind of delivery nano device. So another category, sort of the other end of the price spectrum are, are these vaccines. So the top four coronavirus vaccines were, two of them were double-stranded DNA in a viral capsid and two of them were messenger RNA in, in a lipid packaging. And those, some of those were as little as $2 a dose. So $2 million for a rare genetic disease and $2 for something that everybody should be taking. So there were actually, uh, four papers that we published, all of them using gene therapy. Three of them used AAV virus, it's very small capsid. One of them used cytomegalovirus, but the, the main one that you're probably referring to was with, well, actually Noah Davidson was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab who was on three of those papers. One of them was with the main one where that led to rejuvenate bio as a company was in PNAS on using three genes in various combinations. It started with around 50 genes, 45 or 50 genes that we tested singly to see if they had effects. And these were harvested from the vast uh, literature on the subject. What we knew about aging was put to work. And we asked of all the proteins that go down, uh, with age, maybe if we boosted some of those back up, they would cause reversal or, or make it easier to recover from age related diseases. And we prioritize of all the, maybe say 300 genes that are evolved in aging, we prioritize the ones that looked like they were going down with aging and would spread throughout the body. So we didn't have to get efficient delivery to every single cell. We would allow a little bit of gene delivery followed by a lot of, of protein delivery. And so we, we picked out of the 45 initial genes, we picked down to three, and then we tried every single and double and triple combinations on a variety of different diseases of aging. I started out with four different diseases of, that were age related. They had very little to do with one another other than they were age related diseases. And then somebody heard about this and suggested a fifth one. And now we're, we're doing seven or eight of different diseases. But again, it's a, a good way of testing that but what you're looking at is kind of one of the core components of aging rather than just some minor symptom of aging that you're providing some kind of uh, symptom relief. We want to really get at the core of it. So, you know, that was the, the first paper of the four. So I think aging research has progressed tremendously, uh, recently, along with many other fields of biology and medicine, partly because we are in the times of, uh, where the, we're getting the payoff of the exponential improvement in reading and writing DNA and a, a number of related things that you can make. If you can read and write DNA, that you could make these other te adjacent technologies. And that's all spilling over into aging research. And so it's come from a very kind of sketchy background, you know, where people were, it was a lot of wishful thinking and hyperbole, um, where people would hope that you could just change, you know, your diet a little bit, you know, or the fountain of youth, you change your water source. And I think that was naive. I think now we have very sophisticated understanding of what's sometimes referred to as nine different pathways, major pathways. We have a lot of the molecules in those pathways well-defined. I think we may have to get all nine of them at once to really, because it's otherwise, if you fix eight of them, then the ninth one will kill you and fixing them all at once means a combination therapy. So again, having one drug is not that going to, to do it, but combination therapy is not a, not a completely foreign thought. You know, there might be five drugs that you might use in an antiretroviral therapy, HIV, there might be three or four that you use in a, in a cancer chemotherapeutic setting et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think it's going to be combination therapy as we're going to knock out all the pathways at once. It might have to be a little, little bit personalized I and mean, it has the advantages generic in that it hits multiple diseases and multiple people, but there might be some personalization that's required as well.
if it's truly generic, then it will be inexpensive, just like the vaccines are. Uh, you know, I hope we get aging reversal gene therapies down to $2 a dose the way that the vaccines are. But in any case, I think we can make it something that's equitably distributed.